them how to do typography. It was a little bit too, see, it's a little bit too colorful, so we try it again. It's these monkeys, uh, again, I think the, you can see what they do, the, it's readable, like it's readable film, but their tracking is not really all uh, that appropriate yet. And this film we worked on, we thought it's going to be a year and a half project, and it literally, we just finished it two weeks ago. Uh, I can clearly say it probably was the most unhappy project I've ever worked on in my entire life. Of course, it was born five miles from the German border, you hear it in my accent, and I'm a surprisingly non-spontaneous person. Like, I can really concentrate well, but then I have a difficult time changing my ways. So this was a little film that we made for the film that sort of like is a reminder for myself that I actually should be more flexible. So these bubbles that you see going up there basically, uh, you know, say B, and then it says more flexible. This was done without the camera. This is all digital, uh, digitally produced, made by a young Argentinian, Argentinian designer who came into the studio uh, to make this over the period of a good number of months. I think it's exploding there uh, in a second. Uh, so, I literally have to remind myself to do spontaneous things because my nature, maybe the culture that I was born in, wouldn't really uh, support that. And so to go uh, to the higher known spaces of the museum, so not just in the nice uh, white halls, but also in the hallways and in the bathrooms and so forth. And this was one of the films that we showed there that says, if I don't ask, I won't get uh, a motto of a good friend of mine who basically built his entire career on it by just constantly not taking no for an answer and not, unlike me, being able to ask because I'm afraid that people will say no to me. And that we can just turn up the music and let, leave that one for a second. Can we turn up the music? Well, those stupid Americans. 
you know, clearly they are getting tangled around by their subconscious in the most silly ways. I mean, they're making these giant decisions, what they should do, where they should move to, who they should marry, by something as silly as a similarity in, in terminology in how things sound. And then I look at my own, at my own family, uh, this here is my mother marrying Carolina, marrying my dad, Carl. This is my grandmother, Josephine, marrying my granddad, Joseph. So if there is a Stephanie somewhere in the audience, uh, <laughs> please, right after the question and answers, uh, do come and see me. I'll quickly talk to you about emotions. So I think this is supposed to be sadness. Yes, so there are six basic emotions. This is joy. Clearly fantastic acting here. Uh, disgust. Then you have surprise. Anger. And fear. Now if you paid attention out of these six basic emotions, only one of them is positive, one is in the middle, and four are negative. So that really leads to something that's called the negativity bias, where we actually enjoy negative things much more than positive things. And if you, this is of course the reason why every attempt to make a positive newspaper failed immediately, because we're not interested in it. Like it's we can blame the media all we want, but the fact is, we just don't want positive news. I know it from my own experience, let's say, just 10 days ago, the opening of the Happy Show in Vienna got fantastic reviews throughout from all the Austrian papers, but there was one negative one. And that's the one that I obsessed about. Not all the, not all the, uh, the, super, the super nice ones. And I actually do know why this is so. My brain contains a shortcut, the amygdala, that allows fear to come in much, much, much faster than joy. So my body can actually sense the danger before my eye has a chance to send the information back to my brain. I'm already running. And the reason that is, is because evolution had a reason to turn fear way up in my, you know, Stone Age ancestors, because if it wasn't, they were just dying. But I basically lead a very, very safe life, from fear, uh, free from those fears, and I think that life would be much, much fuller if I would be willing to risk actually more. Uh, I said we are playing, we were playing the whole museums, not just the, uh, the, the main galleries. So of course there were elevators to be had, and then there was also a freight elevator that opens differently. <laughs> <laughs> we have a little, uh, we ask for a donation, and if you put a euro coin in, it rolls right outside of the museum where other people can take the money. Uh, uh, there is a little push button that you push, and then a card comes out and gives you an instruction on how to behave, what to do next. And there's 50 different cards, there's 50 different messages in it, and one of the messages has my cell phone number on it. So I now constantly get new jokes from Vienna. Uh, and it was, it's funny, like, basically, when the show was in the United States, all the jokes were very nice, like very sort of sweet, child, childlike jokes. And it's only since the show is basically in Europe that the jokes become much more existential and a little bit, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, we also, just like I did with you, we measure the happiness of the audience in the show. Like, you know, there's these 10 chewing gum machines and you decide how happy you are by taking one of the chewing gum machines of the appropriate one. So this is the opening in Philadelphia, and this is two weeks into the show in Philadelphia, 
This is two weeks into the show in Toronto, so you can clearly see the Canadians much happier than the Americans, and this is six weeks into Toronto. In those experiments, I also realized that 20 minutes of exercise in the morning actually made a bigger difference in my day than 40 minutes of meditation. So I actually wanted to have some sort of exercise thing in the show. So we have this bicycle that uh, uh, you go on, and if you, if you uh, go on it long and hard enough, you actually generate the electricity that lights up neon typography in front of it, and the neon type says, I think the camera comes around, it says, actually doing the things that I set out to do increases my overall level of satisfaction. And uh, I really believe that. Uh, if I think I should be doing a thing, and then I wind up not doing, it leaves a little residue of discontent. And if I do that a lot, if I don't do the things that I want to do, that these little cones of discontent form to a bigger ball of discontent that actually does bring me down. Uh, we also have this sugar typography. It's type made out of sugars that the, the, the sentence or the sentiment comes from my cognitive therapist who thought that I was avoiding confrontation and that I should step up to it, that I should step up to confrontation. So in this case, there is a, a, a projection on the sugar cubes, and the sugar cubes can actually see the museum visitor. So when you look at the sugar cubes and you're smiling, the sugar cubes turn colorful. And you see, like, this is what's happening, and the visitors realize that this is what's happening and they go and they smile for the sugar cubes and smiling of course is contagious so there is actually a pretty good mood in that gallery as you can see i hate life <laughs> <laughs> he like did such a fantastic job is this whole series uh and like making my life so super super easy yes. so i really really thank you thank you, I really thank you. in this truck driving through a very cold climate but it's really warm inside the truck I have my coffee there clearly uh, and all my supplies including German sausages uh, <laughs> and it's cozy in the truck and I kind of redesigned the truck in my head and I sleep in over it I don't solve whatever I was worrying about but somehow I at least get a good night's sleep and I can solve it the next day we had a part in the exhibition where we talked about my favorite scientific research and I just show you one single part which would be <coughs> compassionate love, friendship love versus passionate love. And if you look at it from a six months point of view, clearly the passionate love is so much better, so much stronger and the, so like the companionate love kind of looks dinky on the, on the side. But then if you look at it from a zoom out from a more 60 year point of view the passionate love is exposed and what it is basically a flash in the pan while it's the companionate love that can grow and jonathan Haidt interviewed many couples that were married as a, for 40 years or longer and it turned out that it, that was all companionate love with a little bit of passion mixed in to the whole thing and he actually says that jonathan says that it is biologically impossible to be passionately in love with somebody for more than six months because the dopamine levels that are, con that are connected to passionate love would be unhealthy for the body and the only couples where you can measure those dopamine levels those high dopamine levels for longer than six for longer than six months are couples where one of the partners is not available meaning married to somebody else or living in Japan. <laughs> says, just now is better. And if we can turn this up a little. Skin away. 
but you, I think you could do much better. So.